What's up you guys? Welcome to today's video. As you can tell by the title, we're going to be talking about what heroin addiction was like for me. And I do want to put a trigger warning here because I'm really going to dig deep for this video and share with you guys my innermost secrets when it comes to what that addiction was like for me. It was so dark and so heavy and I was so sick. And if talking about that kind of thing, if talking about intravenous using is going to upset you, please click off of this video and I'll see you in the next one. I will also link the other videos I've done in this series in the description box down below. If you are new here, my name is Jess. I'm a recovering addict who served time in prison and my entire life story is in the description box down below. If you wanna follow me on any other social media platform, TikTok, Instagram, Patreon, that's $2. It's only ever gonna be $2. That's linked down below, as well as my podcast and my vlog channel. So there's a lot of stuff in that description box. All right, let's kick this thing off. Heroin addiction started for me at a pretty young age. I was about 17 or 18 probably when I tried heroin for the first time. Like many addicts, at first I snorted it and that was my go-to method of ingesting it for a little while. And I'll never forget the first time that the idea of shooting it was planted in my brain. I was at a trap house and I was sitting on the couch with someone. I really looked up to this person. As you guys will read in my memoir about my addiction, coming soon-ish, this person who introduced me to heroin, I looked up to him a lot. I liked him a lot. He was very smart, very well-read, loved psychology, knew every author from Sylvia Plath to Hunter Thompson, and we talked about books all the time. And he was working on his bachelor's degree in psychology, and I would read his textbook for fun at a trap house. So do you see how strange that is? Intelligence just drew me to people. I love studying and learning new things, so intelligence really attracts me to people. We were sitting on this couch, and he had bandanas around his wrists, and I always thought that that was a little strange, but I never put two and two together, he grabs my arm and in a very weird, almost sexual way, starts rubbing my arm and he says, girl, you're wasting so much. Just put it in your arm so you're not wasting it or some weird thing like that that he had said to me. And that seed had been planted. I didn't use that night intravenously, but I was starting to think about how much I was using. It was very expensive to keep up with. And at that point, 17 or 18 years old, I wasn't making that much money selling dope. I would sell pills, weed, coke, whatever I could get my hands on, knives, weapons, whatever I could find I would sell. And I wasn't making that much money I could afford my habit at that time, but it was starting to cost me a lot of money. And I recognized that, and when he said I was wasting a lot of it, and it would save me money, and it would be a better high if I shot it, I started to think about that. I think it's really important to mention here that back then, I didn't have the knowledge that I have now about substance use disorder. I still thought I was in complete control of my addiction. So now when people say to me, addiction is a choice, bay bay. <laughs> I, I tried so hard to convince myself that it was a choice, to convince myself that I had control over it, to tell myself, you can put it down whenever you want to, you can stop whenever you want to, you're deciding to do this, you're in control, it is your choice. I tried to tell myself that over and over and over and over again for almost 10 years because it hurt my pride to know I was not in control. It hurt my pride to know that I couldn't say no, that picking up a substance was not a choice for me, that I had no control over myself and my substance use disorder, and I was a full-blown addict. So when people that have never lived it say it's a choice, I fucking wish that it was. <laughs> I wish that it was. I wish that I had some control over my life. I wish I was deciding to pick up those substances. I couldn't say no. I couldn't, and I chased them, and I chased them. Going back to intravenous using, the first time that I tried, to shoot up, I messed up and I was scared and I gave up. The next day, I tried again and I shot up so little because I was afraid of the potency of it. I was afraid of doing it wrong. I was afraid of it hurting. And it was so strange because I was like trying to teach myself how to do this. So on the second try, when I only shot up a tiny bit, I didn't really feel that high. So I tried again and I shot more, 
and that was the moment where I am now completely addicted to a needle. Taking it a bit further, as my addiction to a needle and to heroin grew, I became so sick and so addicted to mixing up dope in a spoon or the cap of the needle, mixing it up with water, putting a cotton in it and drawing it up. The whole process of that, I was completely addicted to. So just to explain the sickness a little bit better, I want to compare this to self-harm because at first it hurt to put a needle in my arm. Then after a while, I loved that pain and it was almost a form of self-harm with just the needle itself. Uh, my, my arms were completely covered in track marks and in some spots my veins were just messed up or raised or I would have bubbles, not bubbles, but somewhere in between like an abscess and like you missed a little bit and my veins looked disgusting and they looked really bad and there were veins that collapsed and I knew how bad it was, I knew how bad it hurt and I loved that too. So in sobriety, I covered all of them with tattoos because it hurt to even look at my arms and most people wouldn't even recognize it because they're not staring at my elbow ditch, but I saw it every day. I saw the back of my hand and the scars that I had and I hated them. I hated the scars that I had all up here. I even had scars way up here because I followed my veins all the way up my arm to try to find a fresh spot to shoot. And you would think that hurts and that's a bad thing, but to me at that time, I was addicted to the pain of it as well. There were moments where I fantasized about my death, about what my obituary would say, about how long before people just stopped mentioning my name. I completely accepted the fact that I would die young and I thought it was like, a rite of passage or I thought that only the good die young and it was a badge of honor somehow. Now I understand that that is very flawed thinking, I know how wrong that is, but I didn't want to live. I didn't want to be alive, I didn't see any way out of my addiction. Being completely transparent, I also loved and protected my addiction. I didn't want anyone to take it from me because it was the only thing in my life that I felt made me happy, which sounds so crazy to even say out loud because I know that it was destroying me. And even in that moment, I knew it was destroying me, but it was mine and you're not gonna take it from me. And I know that's so hard to understand if you've never lived it. At that time in my life, I felt as though I had no control. I was either living with my parents or I was in school. So, you know, they try to tell you what to do. And obviously I was a child. I, I understand that. I'm just trying to explain it, explain how I felt inside. So school, parents, parole, and then at 18 I married somebody who tried to control my every single move as well. Steve controlled what I wore, if I wore makeup, where I went, who I talked to, and I was on parole. And it was so heavy and I felt like the only control I had was over my addiction. I don't have control over anything else. I can't wear short shorts because then I'm skanky and that was Steve. I can't go out past 10 because I'm on parole. I can't do this and I can't do that. All I had was my addiction and I didn't even have control over that. But I wanted to believe that I did. I wanted to believe that I was okay and that someone would find me dead and I would finally be at peace is what I thought. I would finally not be hurting. I would finally not have to deal with anything. The control, parole, addiction, the drama and the chaos of my life, my depression, my suicidal thoughts, it would all be gone because I would be dead. And I thought that on a daily basis. I didn't know that I could be sober outside of addiction. I didn't know that I could live my life off of a substance. As my addiction to heroin got worse and worse and worse, so did my dealing. The more money I made, the worse I felt. The worse I felt, the more drugs I did. The more drugs I did, the deeper I got into debt. So no matter what I did, even if I did less drugs, made more money and was okay financially, mentally I was not okay. So even though there were moments in my drug dealing life that I made a lot of money, the more money I made, the more depressed I was. I thought it would feel so good to be able to help my family with money, 
to pay my friends bills, to be there for people that needed me. And I thought the ends always justified the means and that's why I continued to sell drugs for so long. But I hated myself. I hated myself in that world. I hated the money. I hated the fact that my phone never stopped ringing. I hated feeling pressured. I hated that no one ever asked me if I was okay. I was so good at putting on a face letting you think that I was okay. I was so good at telling people that everything is gonna be fine. I'm fine, don't worry about me, I'm good. Like, I was so good at that. I was so good at hiding my addiction until I wasn't, until I no longer cared, until it became too much to, to fake, until it became so overwhelming that I'm not wearing a long sleeve shirt in the summer anymore, I'm not putting makeup on my track marks anymore, I'm gonna wear a tank top. If you see my tracks and you don't like it, fuck you. That's how I felt at the end because I didn't have anything left to give when I was using heroin, selling heroin and providing for my ex and other people that I was close to. I felt completely alone, surrounded by people all the time. People either saw me as the connect, someone that could give you dope or someone that could give you money. No one in that world ever genuinely cared about me. And what's ironic is the ones that did care about me, I tried to avoid at all costs because I didn't want them to worry or I didn't want to hear a lecture about my addiction or I didn't want them to look at how sick I had become. So there were people in my life that cared for me at that time, but I was so closed off and guarded and angry and mean that I wouldn't come around. And later my friends and family have told me that they had to walk on eggshells just to be near me. And that sucks. My addiction to heroin was so dark and so heavy and so difficult to overcome. I thought I would never be okay again. I thought I would never be okay after heroin. I left New York in February of 2011 and I got sober from heroin for the last time. Eventually found my way to Arkansas where I used meth for the first time. And it's so strange because I was not an upper person. I liked downers, that was my DOC. But I found a new rock bottom in meth addiction. When I was on heroin, it was really, really bad and it was scary and I was really sick but I was still sleeping, I was still eating, I was still drinking water, I was still doing basic things that you need to do to survive. Meth addiction took me to an all-time low. It took me past any darkness I had ever seen in heroin addiction. I had struggled with suicidal thoughts all my life, but never as frequently as I had when I was in my meth addiction. On heroin, I weighed probably around what I weigh now, uh, 120, 115, 120. Maybe I was a little bit below my natural body weight, but on meth, my weight was about 85 or 90 pounds. I was really skinny, really sick, not drinking water, not sleeping, not eating, not taking care of my body. And the amount of times that I had suicidal thoughts, I, it felt like it was almost every single day. And on a couple of occasions, I almost took my own life. The last time being that I almost shot myself with the Glock that I had, and I just couldn't bring myself to do it. And for those of you that haven't watched previous videos, the night that I almost took my own life is the same night that I decided that I was going to go out on a date with Micah's biological father. I will link that video down below as well. If you guys want me to do a Q&A on, on my heroin addiction, I absolutely will. I feel like there's some things that I'm probably leaving out and, and I'm sure this video is all over the place, but it's so hard to talk about that because it was really hard to get over. I'm so grateful to be alive. I'm so grateful that I get to share these things with you in the hopes that more people will understand addiction. So many people don't make it out and I've lost so many friends to that life, to addiction or mental health issues as well. I've lost a few friends to suicide and um, I just wanna encourage everyone, if you've made it this far in the video, replace judgment and shame with compassion and empathy because you never know what someone's going through. I'm gonna end today's video here. As always, I love you guys. Stay safe, stay sober, whatever that looks like to you, because there is no wrong way to recover. And I will see you in my next one. To lighten up the mood a little bit, I wanna show you my shirt. So it says, have a nice day. <laughs> love you guys.